I'm just going to record the whole session. Um, we're going to take a couple of breaks. We'll take a break around 10 30 or so. We'll break for lunch around noon. We'll take an afternoon break. Uh, that'll let me stop the thing so my laptop will explode. Uh, but I'll just record the whole thing and I'll stick it up on the YouTube channel. How about that? That way you can watch it anytime you want to. Uh, so, my YouTube channel, I guess I should put that up here. That's an important URL. Is YouTube okay with everybody? Yeah? My URL should be something like that. Um, if for some reason you can't find it, concentrated on, uh, just hit me up on Twitter and I can find it for you. YouTube has dumped my account a few times for some reason. So I've had a couple. Uh, if that turned out not to be the right one, then just ping me on Twitter and I'll, I'll hook you up with the right URL. So I'll do that sometime Tuesday. I'll get that uploaded, um, assuming I can get some decent Wi-Fi connectivity. If I can't, then it might be like early next week that I get it uploaded. Cool? Good. So a quick bit about, uh, uh, a quick bit about me and about what we're going to cover today. My name is Tom Jones. I'm a Windows PowerShell MVP award recipient. I write the PowerShell column for Microsoft TechNet Magazine, technetmagazine.com. It's free. Might as well read it. Uh, I write the Decision Maker column for Redmond Magazine, so a little bit more of a, a managerial focus, strategic tactical type stuff. I've been working with Windows PowerShell since, ah, since before it came out, so probably 2005 ish. Uh, I happened to be there at its launch. Uh, they officially launched PowerShell version 1 at uh, TechEd Europe over in uh, November of 2006 sometime. I've been playing with it ever since. Uh, I've written a bunch of books about Windows PowerShell. There's three on the way. You can find those at powershellbooks.com. That's the URL up there. And the first book that I, I did for PowerShell was called Learning Windows PowerShell in a Month of Lunches. And that's what this crash course today is really based on. The, the theory with the book is that you read one chapter a day and you can bring kind of time to process things. And it's got hands on labs and everything else in it. Uh, I do happen to have a few copies at home. I forgot to bring it with me, but if anybody's interested, they're like 30 bucks. I was able to get one clearance from the, the publisher. So if you're interested in one, just come see me sometime. I can bring some back on uh, Wednesday. I've got some sessions on Wednesday morning. I'll just drop by the house and grab them. Uh, the other reason I want to point you to PowerShellBooks.com is there's a couple of free ebooks up there that I'm going to be referring to a few times. Uh, there's a few things that we get into, particularly remote and generating management reports, that just involve a lot of steps. There's a lot of syntax and a lot of steps. So rather than slamming you with all that, expecting you to copy off the video, uh, the book walks you through step by step by step by step by step with screenshots and everything else. Uh, both of the remote and the HTML reporting, both of those ebooks are free. They're just downloads. You don't have to register. I don't need your email address. You can log on. It's just a zip file. You download it and you can have it. Uh, they're in PDF and EPUB form. If you want it in Kindle form, convert it yourself. Um, not that that's not useful. It's just a step I don't have time for. So you can do whatever you want with those. You can redistribute them. They're licensed under Creative Commons. So go to use them however you want to. Uh, they're not there for you. The other URL I want to point out is the top one, and that's probably the most important one, PowerShell.org. That's where you can come if you've got a question about PowerShell. Uh, you're definitely going to run into problems with PowerShell, you're going to get stuck on something, rather than being your head answer for too long, pop up there and ask a question. Uh, if I'm not on the road doing a show like this one or doing a class on site with a customer, uh, I usually can get back to you in a couple hours. Otherwise, it might be 24 hours, because I usually just get to check and emails. But there's a bunch of other people up there who answer questions too. And it is a great place to go get an answer. Uh, we are pretty good about not telling you to just go Google it. Right? We're going to assume you try that and that you actually need help. Uh, and it's, it's a great place to get answers from a lot of people who are real PowerShell enthusiasts that have been using for a long time. Uh, if, have any of you ever heard of scripting meetings? Now, this is something that Microsoft used to run through TechNet. It was a scripting guy. Would do these. That's now been turned over to the community. The community can't run it because it's just gotten too big for one guy. So that is now run out of PowerShell.org. It's a great chance to exercise your scripting skills. Uh, essentially, there's several events in the games, and each one poses a little challenge, and you have to solve it in PowerShell. And then it gets voted on by judges, and there's free prizes. You can get a free pass of tech ed, and free books, and software, and money, and, and prizes, and trips to Hawaii, probably, and all that. 
Do I have something to look out for? All kinds of fun stuff. Take a few minutes and, and dig through that website when you get a chance. Connect yourself with the community. Uh, you know, this, this is how you're really going to get through PowerShell and, and make this a part of your career is by having a, a network of other folks that you can reach out and connect to and know their name, or at least their screen name. Uh, you run into a conference and you have a drink at the bar, and that's really where that make PowerShell work for you in the long run. So take a few minutes to dig through that site. Today is definitely a crash course. It's not a hands on workshop. Uh, you are not going to get very much by trying to follow along, which is one of the reasons I'm recording the whole thing, so that you can go home and review this to your leisure. Now, part of what I want to do here is two things. Obviously, I want to teach you PowerShell. I want to teach you how PowerShell works and how you can use it in your environment. I also need to teach you some of the things you're going to see in the wild. The common things that you're going to see when you're stealing, sorry, repurposing other people's work off the internet. So I want to make sure that you're getting a real world of what PowerShell is, too. So there's kind of the way I wish everybody would use PowerShell, and there's kind of the way a lot of people do it anyway. You're going to see both. You are going to get a lot thrown at you today. This is very much a fire hose approach to Windows PowerShell. We're going to be blasting through material that I normally cover in more like a three-day class at the Amazon Labs. The goal of that is not to overwhelm you. It's to quickly expose you to the maximum number of useful things in PowerShell. Don't worry if it doesn't all make sense or if you don't see a use for it all right away. It's cool. You can come back to this and, and see it again when you find a use for it. This is to let you know what's in there. Because at some point you're going to run into a need, and then you'll be able to say, yeah, you know, I already talked about that, so let me just go in and dig into that a little bit and I'll remind myself. Do ask questions as we go. There is no QA period at the end, uh, especially not after a full day. We're going to be covering way too much of that. You've got a question about something? Ask it. If you've got a, you know, where would I use this in the real world, or how would I apply this to this situation? Ask it. I can't guarantee you I'm going to be able to show you everything right then, but definitely kind of teach the class as we go. Don't be shy about asking questions. Nobody likes to ask questions in these classes. I don't know why. Um, I rarely throw things at you for asking questions. I don't even have bottles of water to throw this time. Uh, that's my usual projectile of choice. If you've got a question, probably kind of other people in the room have a similar question. So be a brave one and ask it. And it's a lot more fun that way. Uh, we will break around 10 30. Uh, Siri should wake me up and, and tell me to stop then. We'll break around noon for lunch, maybe a couple minutes earlier just to get a head start on that. Uh, I have no idea where it is. Hopefully, someone does in your book or whatever. You can figure that out. And then we'll break in the afternoon uh, to give you a little bit of a leg stretch. If you need to get up and wander out in the middle, that's fine. Uh, the only thing I ask that everybody check all of your sneaky noisy devices right now and make sure they're not going to be noisy. Because I have this huge attention thing and if an electronic thing goes off, I'm like lasered in on that. And I will answer it. I will walk over and take it and answer it. Uh, and it won't go well. So shut all those stupid little things off and we're just going to focus on PowerShell. How many of you play with PowerShell a little bit? That's good. Excellent. How many of you are mostly running XP in your environment still? Client. Who's mostly getting into seven? Vista? Anyone do Vista? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, server side, uh, 2003? Uh, 08? R2? That's uh, good. R2 is awesome. 2012? Any, any GS card to get in there? So let's talk uh, real quick about versions and capabilities. So we've got three versions of PowerShell out there now. One, two, three. Uh, no one should be running version one for any reason whatsoever. Unless you've got some weird non Microsoft piece of software that just took a hard dependency on version one. <coughs> All of your machines that have PowerShell should at least be on V2. Now, V2 can be installed on everything from XP or Server 2003 and later. Version 3 of PowerShell is the new version that is out that can be installed on Windows 7, Server 2008, 2008 R2. And it comes with Windows 8 and Server 2012. Version 3 notably cannot be installed on Vista. Sorry. Uh, no backward compatibility for that. However, if you've got a, an environment with mixed PowerShell version 2 and version 3, they can still talk to each other. Uh, they need to be installed side by side. If you have version 2 on a machine and you upgrade it to 3, the two engines stay in there. So if you have a compatibility issue with version 3 of PowerShell, you can always get the version 2 engine up and running. 
most of the cool stuff in PowerShell is not in PowerShell. Most of the cool stuff you're going to do is to manage things, to manage networking adapters, to manage DHCP server, DNS server, whatever else. That functionality is provided by SAPINs, the modules for PowerShell. But those are OS specific. In other words, PowerShell can do a lot more to a server 2012 machine than it can to a 2008 R2 machine. Not so much dependent on the version of PowerShell as it is the version of the OS. What you are buying when you buy server 2012 is a more manageable operating system. So there's a lot of strong reasons from a manageability perspective of getting all of your machines on the latest and greatest version. Windows 8 has way more management by PowerShell than Windows 7, even though both can run the same version of PowerShell. So I am running Windows 8. I have a Windows Server 2012 domain controller floating around in the background. If you've got any questions that when I do something, hey, would I be able to do that on Windows 7? Just ask me, I'll tell you. Uh, if it's core to PowerShell, yes. If it involves an OS specific plugin, probably not so much. Uh, that said, there's a lot of, of you know, cross compatibility too. So if you've got a question about whether it will work or what it will work on, just ask me on the internet here. I'd be happy to tell you if it's going to go down to an older version or not. Who thinks they're definitely going to be moving this from 2012 to their R and up? Eventually. Yeah, that's good. Uh, it's a little easier to roll pick the server versions into the data center than it is to you know, roll the entire client base. I am very much a server guy. I could really not care less about client operating systems. Uh, for me, there just needs to an end. And that end for me is the server. So there might be some client based management things you asked about I might not know the answer to. Um, if I don't, I will totally make something up for you. Uh, that sounds good. And then I'll try to point you in a direction where you can go find the correct answer for it. Uh, but I'm very much a server guy. Is, is there a central place for the plugins and the staffers? Is there a central place to get all the modules and staffers? That'd be nice. <laughs> no, for the most part, you know, it's, it's, it's the same old deal. It's, it's, uh, for Server 2012, there's, there's an RSAP, right? A remote server administration toolkit, and that only installs on Windows 8, but it does install all the Windows server stuff onto Windows 8, but it won't install on Windows 7. There's a separate Windows 7 RSAP that aligns with 2008 R2, and that's going to be for a while. But, uh, I will kind of show you where Microsoft is going with this idea. How many of you uh, have some restrictions on your data center and that, as an admin, you kind of have to promote into a jump machine to get into the data center, and then you can go off the server from there? Yeah, that's a fairly common setup, especially in highly restricted environments. I work with a lot of financial companies, and they do that a lot. Uh, is that your industry? What's, what are you doing over here? Domain. For domain. Oh, yeah, well, also a highly managed environment. Uh, Microsoft is, is kind of a big fan of the whole jump server idea, and I'm going to show you how you can probably set things up so you never have to install management tools on your client machine, uh, which is even better. One of the features of Server 2012, in fact, is PowerShell Web Access, which is a, a web version of PowerShell. So you, you browse into it, and then you get PowerShell, and it can pick all the machines in your data center. Uh, it even looks good on an icon, although, you know, with the command line interface on icon. So, okay, let's jump in. Um, I am going to be using, for pretty much this whole session, uh, this is the PowerShell ISE integrated scripting environment. Uh, it consists of two panes. That pane you were seeing there was the script pane where, where you would write scripts. Uh, this is the console pane where I'm just going to type commands, hit enter, and they're going to work, hopefully. Um, there is a console app as well, which exhibits a lot of the same behaviors as this console pane. They are a little different. There are some different behaviors. One of the things you can do in the console app that won't work here is run a transcript. There's a command called start transcript and it'll capture everything that flies by in the window into a text file, which can be really convenient. If I wasn't videotaping this, I would be running a transcript for you. Um, but you can't do that in here. What I like about this, though, is the little, what do they call this, IntelliSense? Right, so you never have to finish typing all your commands. You can just kind of pick it from the list and it'll 
also help you figure out what parameters are available for commands and everything else. So it's one of the reasons I like to use this thing. It's a pretty slick little little tool. This is version three, right? This is PowerShell version three, yeah. Yeah, because it's on Windows 8, which is all that will run on, on Windows 8. Uh, you can't put version two on this. So let's just talk real briefly about you know kind of what PowerShell's approach is. How many of you have some DB script experience or maybe Perl or some other wacky language? Yeah. And and you've kind of gotten the, the message that PowerShell is the, the scripting language successor to DB script? Yeah? No, it's not. I really wish people would stop telling you that. PowerShell is not a scripting language. It's a command line interface, just like you know the Unix shells, Bash or, or C shell or whatever you're into. Like most shells, it has a scripting language. It does contain a scripting language, but that's only part of what it is. So we're, for most of today, at least the, the big chunk of the morning, we're gonna focus on PowerShell as a command line interface. Type a command, hit enter, get results. We don't have to code anything. It's all gonna stay in this console pane. Uh, so quick quiz, what's the command to get a listing of files and folders? All louder. Get child line is mine, ls. Who knows dir? <laughs> Seriously, who knows dir? Okay, you worried me there a little bit. Uh, in fact, let's just get this out of the way so I know where I stand. How many of you have ever run ping? How many of you have not? Okay, so the rest of you just aren't participating. That's fine. I, I did a class one time where I asked who, who's run ping and no one raised their hand. I said, no, seriously, who's run ping? No one. Okay, who hasn't? And they all raised their hand, like, oh, wow, okay. This is going to be a little bit of a different class. Um, PowerShell uses a lot of the same commands you're used to. dir, if you want to use ls, it does the same thing. cd to change folders. Uh, just like in the shells, you're probably used to, if you've got a value that has a space in it, like program files, you do need to put it in quotation marks. So you're going to be able to jump in and do a lot of the stuff that you're already used to pretty well. These commands that I'm using right now, like dir, is uh, really just an alias. It's a nickname for what a, a, a PowerShell really calls get child item. And that's going to take me to the most important thing in PowerShell, is the help command. How many of you go back to MT4? Oh good, quite a few of you. So in your head, go back to MT4 and then fast forward just a couple of years until Windows 2000 came out. Right, because that's where we got Active Directory and everything else. Think about the first thing you did when you opened Active Directory users and computers for the very first time. What was the first thing you did? Other than like click on something and hit delete to see what would happen. <laughs> Bad idea, by the way. What'd you do? You, you right clicked stuff, right? You expanded the little tree view thing. You ever hover over the toolbar buttons and to get the little tooltips pop up to tell you what the button would do? Those things, the, the tooltips, the context menus, those are called discoverability features and they're one of the reasons that a GUI is so great because you can figure out what you can do without actually having to do anything potentially destructive and without doing the one thing that we IT professionals hate above all other things, reading manuals. Right? We tell users that all the time, don't we? RTFM. Right? Everybody knows what RTFM stands for? Yeah, the F isn't for friendly. <laughs> uh, the first PowerShell book I wrote was called Windows PowerShell TFM. Right? You get it? Um, except in Europe, that's, the, the RTFM thing is very much an Americanism, as it turns out. So it was over at a conference in Europe, they're like, but what does the TFM stand for? Oh, uh, uh, the fabulous manual. Look, Elvis. <laughs> uh, PowerShell, being a command line interface, doesn't have a lot of, of toolbars or right clicks or anything else that you can play with, but it still has a discoverability feature. It still gives you the ability to figure out what it can do, and it's this help command. So when I run help on dir, it's going to show me that this is actually a command called get-child item. It's going to show me the syntax for the command, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Give me a nice description for the command, everything else. Who knows what the wildcard character is? 
Asterisk, yeah, star, splat, whatever you want to call it. Don't call it splat, that means something different in PowerShell and you'll confuse the other PowerShell kids if you say splat. Uh, so star, asterisk is fine. If you want to do something with event logs, take a short little keyword. Now this isn't a Google search, it's just a, a text matching search, just a wild card match. Throw that little keyword in between a couple of asterisks and hit enter and it will list the commands that match that. If it doesn't find any commands that match that, it will do a full text search across the synopsis and description for every single command that it can find on your system. So this is a good way to find stuff. Now, in this case, if I wanted to play around with event logs, I have the first one, clear event log, get event log, and right away, you can start to get some idea of what commands are available to you. This is a great feature. Now, one of the biggest differences between PowerShell version 2 and PowerShell version 3, and one of the big reasons you should really put PowerShell version 3 on your computer, is in version 2, it would only do this across commands that you had manually loaded into memory first. So, you see the catch-22 there. I'll show you what commands, if you tell me which one it is you want. I don't know, but as soon as you do, I'll help you find it. This, version 3, will scan across all the commands that are on your system, even if you haven't taken the time to load them into memory yet. So it's a lot more effective. In fact, if you try to run a command and it's not loaded, it'll just load it for you automatically in the background, which is really, really nice. So it's a lot easier to find your commands this way. Really think about that. Here's the other thing, is once you get the command, how many of you have two monitors at work? How is that not the best feature ever? Ask for help with a minus show window. So it pops it up in a separate little pretty, nicely formatted window that you can float off to that second screen so you can read the syntax while you're trying to type the command in the other window. And at the bottom of this window is the most useful part of all PowerShell help, examples. If you are Googling for examples of commands, without looking here first, you are wasting your time. Because most of the commands help files have got numerous different examples in them, and they're usually quite well written, and usually very practical. So this is where to start. How many of you think you're gonna wind up on Google or Bing anyway? Oh, come on, of course you probably are. That's fine, I wanna give you a tip. This command, get event log, that I'm looking at, in most of these other ones, you see the second column there, it says category. What are most of these? What category are they? It's a C-M-D-L-E-T, commandlet, is how it's pronounced. That word was invented for PowerShell. It didn't exist before PowerShell. So if you're looking for help with a particular command, you're looking for examples on Google, add the word commandlet to your search string in the search engine and that will tend to restrict the results you get to just PowerShell results. And that's why they invented a word. They used the word commandlet for search engine optimization because it only relates to Windows PowerShell. So a little tip there to make your Googling life happier. How many of you would use Google instead of Bing? Yeah, that's too bad, poor Microsoft. All right, let's dig into these help files just a little bit. This is a command called get service. What you are looking at here are three, and this is in the syntax section of the command, you're looking at three different ways in which this command can run. Uh, back, you know, let's go back to the get event log one because that's an even better example. Help get event log. This one is two different parameter sets. Those two blocks there are two different ways of running this command. One of the biggest things that gets people confused is they start trying to mix and match parameters between these, and that's the one thing you can't do in PowerShell. You'll notice that the second parameter set has a minus list parameter at the end of the first line, and that the first parameter set does not have a minus list parameter. That's the big difference between them. If you are using minus list, the only other commands you can use are computer name and as a string. You cannot jump up there and use after 
you can't use before, you can't use newest, you can't use source, you can't use username. You cannot mix and match parameters between these parameter sets. That's one way of really kind of avoiding one of the bigger power shell gotchas. What do brackets usually mean in a health file like this? Square brackets. Optional. Optional. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to type that bit if you don't want to. So looking at the first parameter set, notice that the log name parameter accepts a string, right? So this is how PowerShell parameters are constructed. The parameter name starts with a dash, so it's dash log name. Then there's a space, never a colon or an equal sign or anything else. And then you provide a string value for presumably the log name you're after. If I run this command, I must provide a log name. Because the entire parameter, log name and string, is not contained in square brackets. Right, so when I look at a parameter, I'm looking at, oh heck, stop that. I'm looking at this. That's the parameter. Its name and its value together make the parameter. That is not in square brackets. That means it's mandatory. I have to do this if, I'm, if I want to run the command successfully. What I do not have to do is actually type minus log name which gives you a few ways of potentially running the command. Get event log minus log name security newest 10. That's one way to do it. Another way is to just provide that value security in the first position because the minus log name part is the optional part. However, once you stop typing out the parameter name, it's up to you to make sure everything comes in the correct order. So now you're taking something on yourself, and if it doesn't work, it's your fault. It'll work if you get everything in the right order. But what you don't want to do is start messing around with it and getting it in the wrong order. Who thinks that'll work? Yeah, not at all. I suggest, as you get started, stick with typing out all of the parameter names all the time, because then it doesn't matter what order they go in, and it'll still work. So really, really kind of focus on that. Another neat thing that you'll find in the help, let's go back to the help for it, are the occasional parameter, like computer name. You can see that this accepts a string, right? So it wants a computer name, maybe an IP address, I guess. The two square brackets jammed against each other means it will accept multiple values. And one way, and I'll be showing you other ways, one way to give it multiple values is with a comma separated list. Get event log, computer name, localhost, comma DC. What will that do? Anybody? You're not winning any prizes this way, guys. <laughs> It'll get the event log for both computers. Really? Which event log? Oh. Can't run the command without specifying minus log name. It's mandatory. Because it's mandatory, PowerShell prompts me for it. And it probably didn't find one of those. I don't think I have the service running for a local host to work. Let's just take it back to DC and, yeah, there we go. Control C is your friend, by the way. That'll stop a command from running most of the time. There's a few commands that it won't stop, but most of them. So you're going to use the help command to find the commands that are available, and then you're going to use it again to learn how to use the command. And there are examples that will show you how to use the command. That show window help you can also get in text form help get event log minus full. We'll run through the entire thing just there in the window. I like the show window option. When you first install PowerShell version 3, you're going to be a little bit alarmed by the help, though, because there isn't any. PowerShell doesn't come with help. And that's because Microsoft wants to be able to update the help continuously when they find problems with it. So one of the first commands you're going to run is update help. That's going to scan through every command that's installed on your system. Each command module, each package of commands is tagged with a URL where updates can be found. So in the case of the Microsoft ones, 
your server will be going, or your computer will be going up to a Microsoft web server and attempting to pull down the help. Anybody have machines in your network that can't get to the internet? They're screwed. No, they're not. Um, there's another command called save help. That will save the help down to a location you tell it to, like on a file server, and then update help has a parameter, and it lets you say, instead of going up to the web, go over here, I've already downloaded everything. And it'll just pull it that way off your intranet. So they thought of that. Um, update help will actually only check once per day. If you run it multiple times per day, it will only check the first time. It, it has a little 24-hour countdown. If you want to force it to re-download, you can use the force parameter. That'll override the 24-hour countdown and make it check again. Uh, here's another fun little trick. Minus online. That, for Microsoft commands, will pop up the help from the TechNet website which is usually the latest, greatest, awesomest version of the help. And it also has community contributed content. So folks can go up there and log in with their Microsoft.net Hotmail Live Passport ID, and you can add more examples or correct problems or whatever else. So that's another great place to look. And it pulls it up in your default web browser. So you can float that off to your other monitor too and, and use it there. So help is a really important command in the overall PowerShell lexicon. In fact, there's three commands that you really need to know going out of here today, and help is one of them. The second is get command. Watch this. This is a fairly fresh Windows 8 machine with the Windows 8 Remote Server Administration Toolkit installed. So I should have all of the server commandlets here as well. Quite a few commands, uh, a lot of them in there. Get command is useful because it recognizes the structure of the command. Notice the naming convention for these commands? Kind of scan over that for a second. In fact, if you like, I can scroll up a bit. Oops. Notice anything about these? They all start with a verb show, or start, or stop, or set. And I know some of the verbs, like you, aren't actually verbs in the English language, but get over it. Everybody else, you have 20 minutes more time. You don't use my verb. Get out. Verb, and a dash, and then a singular noun. It's never a plural. So it's get service, not get services. You'll notice that a lot of these also have got uh, a little prefix, here's a great one, stop NLB cluster, stop NLB cluster node. NLB is a little prefix that tells you what type of cluster we're talking about. So typically any given technology, DNS, DHCP, network adapters, whatever else, will add a little prefix to the noun so that it's clearer what that goes with. The only exception to that in the Microsoft world is Exchange Server. So what do you think the command is to retrieve a list? Probably, how many of you use Exchange? 2,700. Yeah, so what's the command to get a list of mailboxes? You know how to get a mailbox. Get mailbox. Not a trick question. It probably should be like get ex mailbox, right? Because there's other mailboxes in the universe. But they didn't think of that whole now prefix thing until after the ship exchange. So that's just how it is now. Uh, that means before Lotus Note got in there from the power shell, it was just taking mailbox. Sure, that's going to happen eventually. But now it can't. Uh, so verb dash noun. And one of the reasons that get command is kind of cool, show me all the commands that use the word event in their noun. So it's another way of finding commands on your system. There's parameters that will let you find the commands with a particular parameter. So show me all the commands that have a computer name parameter, things that can talk to other computers. Show me everything. There's also a minus verb. So show me all the commands that use the word new as their verb. Those are all the things PowerShell can create new of. Users, network adapters, app locker things, certificates, blah, 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 blah. Right? Discovery. This is crucial. Now, I will tell you guys something. How many of you are, are big fans of reading the manual? Yeah, at least you're truthful. 
How many of you put together the IKEA furniture? The, you know, you ever put together furniture? You ever put one of those together? You ever do that without reading directions? No, because you'll miss one of those little hand locks and it'll fall over on your dog, trust me. <laughs> if you are not willing to read the help in PowerShell, and I don't just mean skipping ahead to the examples, but look, I know you've got a job to get done, I know your hair is on fire, and at the time you're learning the command, you're under pressure, and you're only learning the command you need to immediately solve the problem. I get that. But if you're just skipping ahead, if you're skimming, if you're not willing to read the help file, read them, comprehend them, you will fail. You will not be successful with PowerShell. There's just no way around it. It's not going to happen for you. So keep that in mind. Make sure you're taking the time to read through these things. There are so many capabilities in PowerShell that you will never discover unless you read the help. For example, if I told you there was a command called export CSV, somebody take a guess at what this does. Exports a file to a comma separated value. Everybody know what a CSV file looks like basically? Yeah. All right. Now I want you to create a tab delimited file, a TDF. How would somebody do that maybe? Not you. You've clearly been using it too much. You're wrecking my pattern. Don't ever go to a copper guild show and do that. He'll kill you. Do you would you go looking for an export TDF command? Yeah, maybe. That's a fair thing to do. You won't find one though. But if you read the help, you will find that there is a delimiter switch that lets you change the delimiter from being a comma to something else. Reading the help is absolutely crucial. How many of you think you would use PowerShell to create management reports? Simple ones. Sure. PowerShell has a command for HTML. Check this out. Get service, convert to HTML. Neat, huh? Well, it's HTML. Where would that be more useful? In a file, probably, sure. Anybody ever uh, do redirection? Like, if you were in command.exe, how would you get a dir into a text file? The little angle bracket. Yeah, yeah, that'll work in PowerShell too. Here's what that looks like. It's not awesome. What if you wanted to put some more stuff in there, like a header, or maybe a footer with the date it was created, or, or maybe have it help you make it look prettier? Would that be interesting? Well, you can do it if you read the help. Because this command has got a lot of parameters for adding different bits of content and style sheets and all manner of other awesomeness. In fact, this is one of the things we're going to really dive into today because I've been having a lot of fun with it this past weekend and figured out some cool stuff. My point, though, is be prepared to read the help files. I am not going to be able to show you every single command. There's more than 2,000 commands installed in my system right now. And even the ones I do show you, I'm not going to be able to show you all of their capabilities. But if you can take a minute to just scan through the help files, how many of you have a page a day calendar? Farside or Dilbert or whatever, throw it out. Read the help for a commandlet a day. There's only a couple thousand. So what's that, like five years? Stick with the money you'll save on page a day calendars. But if you can just skim the help on these things, and start to pick up some of the other capabilities they've got, then when you actually need that capability, you'll remember and you'll be able to go look for it using the help command. Sensible? The thing that sets PowerShell aside from other shells is how it deals with data that it has in its head. Uh, let's take this as an example. Let's run get service real quick. How many columns of information do I have here? I'm concerned that only one guy could count that high. <laughs> Coffee is in the back of the room if you need that for math purposes. Uh, there are three columns, name, display name, and status. Is this all the information that Windows knows about a service? No, certainly not. What else, what else must it know? 
Just to start up, start up mode, right? Automatic disable, what else? The executable, yeah, dependency information, uh, the account that all the times. What was that? The script, yeah. Yeah, it was different for the display name. Even more helpful. So here's what happens. When you run a command in PowerShell, like to get service, in its head, it constructs, can we just for terminology agree that this is called a table? Right? Kind of a grid. You can see this in Excel maybe, right? Okay. So it constructs a table in its head with columns for all that information. Every bit of it. Essentially hundreds of columns of information, depending on what command you're in. But it knows it's not all going to fit on the screen. So under the hood, Microsoft ships a bunch of configuration files, and they basically say, hey, if the guy didn't tell you what he wants to see, uh, just show him these three things. Those are likely to fit without having to get cut off too much, although you'll notice I still do have the three little dots that tells him I'm having things cut off. We'll show you how to fix that later. So just show him these things. What you are going to need to do is figure out what else it can show you, right? So we need to do some terminology fixing. Uh, this is no longer called a table. It is called a collection. And it is a collection of services in this case. This is not a row. It is an object. So this is not a table with rows. It is a collection of objects. And those aren't columns anymore. They're called properties. And to find out what other properties it could have displayed, run the command again and pipe it to get member, which uses the alias GM, like the car company, but without the tragic financial bailout. So <laughs> pipe it to get member, and this will show you all the different properties that could potentially be displayed. There's a few different types of properties, alias property, script property, regular property. For all intents and purposes, they're the same to us. Those are things you could potentially display on the screen. Cool? Do not make this mistake. This is a command called get process, uses the alias ps. See the column headers there? CPU, S, VM, M. Those are not property names. Sometimes the column headers do match the property name, like ID and process name. Sometimes the column headers are just there to look pretty. The only way you can definitively figure out what the property name is, is to pipe it to GM. And that will tell you what properties are actually available. Cool? So PowerShell doesn't start deleting columns until it's done running all the commands that you give it and it's ready to display something. Uh, let's do a little, little quiz here. I want to find, and you guys are going to help me with this, so you're going to have to talk. I know it's scary. I want to find the 10 biggest processes based on their paged memory usage, or PM. So there's a property for that, right? There was a column for it. There it is, PM. See, it's the third column. So what are the 10 biggest processes? This is taking too long. What would, what would help? Let's sort them. I'm going to pipe this to a command called sort object. The deal with PowerShell is it keeps that entire table structure and passes it from one command to the next. You've all done like dir pipe more before to get a paged output of a directory, yeah? Jiggle your heads up and down. Good. This is the same idea. We're taking that, that table structure and piping it to sort object. Which property do I want to sort on? I want to sort it on PM. So we'll hit enter. Probably a little bit easier to pick out the top 10 now. Let's make it more like a Letterman top 10 though. I'll hit up arrow and add the descending switch. So the default order is ascending, descending flips it around. All right, can you see the top 10 now? No, why not? Because it scrolled up too far. Yeah, let's pipe it to another command called select object and ask it to just give me the first 10. So again, PowerShell keeps that entire data structure and passes it from one command to the next command to the next command. 
And when it finally gets all the way to the end of the pipeline, which is what this is called, it does whatever it needs to do to display the output. And we're going to work on customizing that output display a little bit too. The pipeline is what makes PowerShell unique. Unix shells have a pipeline as well, but they don't operate in quite the same fashion. Uh, they tend to rely on text manipulation. I'm not going to sort on the column name PM. I want you to tell me what character position I have to go out to or give me a regular expression and I'll grep it and set it and off it and block. Which is fine for Unix because that's how it works, but this is how PowerShell works. This is how Windows works. You don't need to worry about what the output looks like until you get all the way to the end and you're ready to look at it. It's just the data structure that gets passed to the machine uh, command to command. And I want to point out something else too. I didn't run a big script here. Command to command, I wasn't happy with it, so I hit the up arrow, brought it back, added a little bit to it, and ran it again. And I kept doing that over and over until I was happy, one step at a time. You don't need to start out by constructing these things out of whole cloth. You know, I mean, pulling an entire thing out of the air is, is tough. You'll get there, but in the beginning, do it one bit at a time, and up arrow, modify, up arrow, modify. Iterative, and it goes pretty quickly, as you saw. Show this to you later in the day, but one thing we ran into is when we have a custom function in that pipeline, and if you encounter an error, depending on the severity of the error, it forgets the pipeline version. Like if it doesn't continue to pass the non error collection pass. Yeah, so, so PowerShell does have a very specific error handling capability, and if you are going to have a pipeline that is likely to hit an error, there's kind of another way to structure it so that you can recover from that, and we will get there. We'll do that probably. Depends on how you guys act after lunch. You're all go get them and do it if you're like, uh, no. Um, let's do a little bit more uh, fun with this. Who wants to play around with the formatting of this a little bit? Play along, raise your hand. All right, let's play around with the formatting. Yeah, we're doing good. Format list. You can give it a set of properties like ID, name, PM, VM, and it'll display everything in a list format. You can also tell it, what's the wildcard character? Give me all the properties in a list. So you can see everything. You could then redirect that out to a file if you wanted to, yeah? Uh, which we'll do in a second. There's another version of this called format wide which only takes a single property. You can only give it one, uh, and here's why. It displays multiple columns, and you can actually tell it how many columns you want to see, or even tell it to just auto-size and fit as many as it possibly can. Useful. Here's my favorite formatting command. Format table, property star, auto-size me. Oh, and it's still cutting stuff off. Minus wrap. Kind of neat, yeah? Let's take off the auto size and just have it display everything. And if you do that a lot, it's like your little own matrix screensaver. Um, how many of you have logon scripts at work? Yeah, so fun story. Put this in your login script, right? Just like 10 times in a row. So and you could put like a welcome to the matrix or whatever, it's fine. Um, who's East Coast again? Which bit of the East Coast? Connecticut. Connecticut. Uh, so you probably remember before your phone company was Verizon, for a while they were Bell Atlantic. And then before that they were 9X. We're focusing on the Bell Atlantic time frame. Because uh, I used to work for Bell Atlantic. I was a, a, the network manager in the Pennsylvania region. And does anyone from the East Coast remember who Bell Atlantic's spokesperson was for a long time? Big black gentleman with a deep, deep voice. It was James Earl Jones. So, and he did a lot of voice work for them. And so, whenever uh, you would dial like information, it would do well, dial line. And we thought, what cooler thing in the world could you do than get a wave file of that, which required a lot of calls to directory systems? But we got a wave file of it and stick it at the top of a log on certain morning, right? So, every log on, well, and we thought the only thing that could be cooler than that is what else did James Earl Jones do the voice for? 
This format command comes with a price. And this is probably one of the biggest things I, I see newcomers to PowerShell struggle with. Because you, you go through all this garbage, you, you've worked up this big command, you've got it looking exactly, exactly the way you want it to look. And the most natural thing in the world is to want to put that into a file. Because we talked about creating reports, right? So who could see yourself constructing some big long thing and then putting it into maybe an HTML file? Yeah? All right, well I already showed you the command. What was it? Convert to HTML. And rather than using the angle bracket for redirection, I'm gonna show you what PowerShell is really doing under the hood and it's piping that to out file. And then I'm gonna give it the file path and we'll call this report.html. Boom. Let's take a look at that puppy. Is that what you expected? Yeah, that's my list of processes, right? No. PowerShell format commands consume whatever you pipe into them, and what they output is a bunch of <coughs> Microsoft PowerShell internal formatting spew. So the practical upshot of this, the only thing you can do after a format command is pipe it directly to a file or to a printer or just let it show up on the screen. That's it. Once you have formatted something, you are done. Anytime you're looking at a command line and it says format something and then right after the format comes pretty much any other command that doesn't start with the word out. It's wrong. It's not going to work. Once you've formatted it, you can't convert it. You can't export it. You can't do anything with it. You can out it to a file and what's going to go into that file is exactly what would have appeared on the screen. So keep that in mind. Once you have formatted, your day is done. You're over. You're done playing with the command. Cool? Don't let that one trip you up. That's the biggie. Let's do this. Uh, get WMI object. We're going to talk about WMI in a little bit, but I want to kind of jump into it right now. And I'm just going to pick out my local drive, which is drive type 3. What unit of measurement does free space and size look to be in? Yeah, bytes. How many of you deal with bytes in your storage systems? Yeah. If you're down to bytes, you got a problem. What do, what do you usually want to see that in? Gig, gigabytes. On a, on a SAN or something, terabytes is probably fair, but gigabytes at least. Maybe megabytes for free space. Well, all right, let's play with it then. I'm going to run that same command again, and I'm going to pipe it to select object again. You could do the same trick with format table, but in a second I'm going to show you why I chose to use this instead of format table. Property. Let's grab the device ID. Actually, you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to make this prettier. Clipboard. Paste. Neat thing in PowerShell is that you can hit enter after a pipe character and it'll, it knows that 
the next line goes with the first one. Uh, you can also do that after a comma. That structure that starts with an at sign is called a hash table. Um, programmers will also call it a dictionary object or an associative array. And we're building a very specific one that's designed to work with the select object command or one of the format commands. There's a very specific way they want this thing to be constructed. Each one of those hash tables consists of two parts, two units, and they're separated by a set of them. Everyone see that? The first has to be called name, or n, or it, for historic reasons, it can also be called label or l. I do not like using the lowercase l. Like you saw I used n as an abbreviation the second time, right? I do not like using the lowercase l. Don't tell me why. It looks like the number one. I cannot tell you how many times I've had tech editors in my books scream at me that this code doesn't work because they're having the one instead of an l. So I try to erase that from their memory. Name or n, and that's what I want my new column to be called. Then the semicolon. The expression, or e, goes in curly brackets. And this is executable code, so it's a formula. And I'm taking dollar sign underscore is a special placeholder in PowerShell. It means whatever was typed into me. So the first command that ran here retrieves information about logical disks, right? That's what got typed into the select object. And so that's what dollar sign underscore represents. It represents the logical disk in this case. We don't want the entire logical disk, right? There's a lot of pieces to a logical disk. Free space, size, the type of a drive, the device ID. So in math, don't we use a decimal point to represent fractions? So I'm just taking the fraction of that, which is its size, or free space, and I'm dividing it by one gigabyte. PowerShell recognizes KB, MB, GB, TB, and I think maybe DB. They're base 2 numbers, not base 10 numbers. So technically it's a kbyte, 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 kbyte. But we can think of them as gigabytes because it's less funny to say. So I'm dividing by 1 gigabyte. So that's going to give me a display of gigabytes, yes? Can anybody anticipate what I'm not going to like about this when I run it? Who's good at math? What am I not going to? It's going to have a lot of decimal places. So let's run it. It'll have an error. Oh, that's just because my keyboard is tiny, tiny. Let's try running it. Yeah, lots of decimal places. Two ways to fix that. Who wants to see the easy way? Who wants to see the hard way? Really? That never happens. I'm going to tell PowerShell to turn this into an integer, which means stripping off the decimal portion, right? Integers are whole numbers. In doing so, it will actually follow rounding rules. So it will round it up or down, depending on if it's 0.4 or 0.5. Uh, so that's the easy way. I can't believe some actually asked for the hard way. That's the hard way. Not really that much harder. Because format commands are specifically designed to create a visual display, format table, which uses the same syntax, extends the syntax to include a couple of other options. You can control column alignment, column width, and in this case, the format string, telling it I want a number with two decimal places. So I'm actually doing better than just making it a whole number. I still have some decimalage, just not as much as before. 
So let's run this one first. Neat thing in the ISE, uh, you can right click and run just the highlighted bit or just hit F8 to run the selection. So there we go, whole numbers. And now let's run this one and see what's different. And I get my little decimal placeage. Cool trick? You can get really, really creative with that. Uh, here's another fun trick. How many of you can see yourselves writing a script whose ultimate output needs to be displayed to a less than technically proficient user, like your boss or anyone you work with? Okay. Oops, sort. Sort on PM, do it in descending order. We'll select the first 10 and we'll pipe it to out grid view. That's pretty neat, yeah? These are sortable. You can click them and you can add filter criteria. Hide columns, show columns. So you can kind of play with this. It's not dynamic, it's not updating itself. This isn't task manager but they can play with this static set of data that you've given them. So outgrid view is pretty cool. Questions so far? I'll put the ugly syntax back up. Yeah. So now if you want to say that it's a file, do you have to keep the uh, pipe characters in there? If I want to say if the script is a file, you mean? Yeah, and run it as a file. I can leave this exactly as is and save it as a file and run it, yeah. Yeah, PowerShell is okay with you hitting enter. Uh, after the, and I know the pipe character is tough to see because it's light gray, um, but it's there. You can hit enter after a pipe, after a comma, or after a semicolon. So you can really make your, your scripts look pretty. Uh, like in this thing, for example, I could do this. Because it's after a, oops, after a semicolon. Rats, that would have been so awesome. So you can do that. You really start to break things down and make the formatting pretty, and it makes it easier to read and, and troubleshoot in the long run. Do you have to keep the pipe? No, nothing's implied. Running a file is exactly the same as manually typing the same things. So the pipe character does have to stay. The grid view is not portable. It is an end state. Uh, it does not have a save as option. So no. Um, how many of you think you might want to output to an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, that's like really, if you use Excel like for reporting and stuff like that, yeah, it's pretty suboptimal. Um, but if you look at something like the PowerShell community extensions, which is a, a free set of add-ins for PowerShell, they have a, an export Excel command. It's not that much different than just opening a CSV in Excel, frankly, but a lot of people do like to do manipulation of Excel spreadsheets from PowerShell, and I never got into it myself, but you can do it. What else? Any other questions on this stuff? Okay. Remind me again who has some programming experience. Any language will do. Okay, so in that programming language, What's the, uh, the comparison operator for equality? Equal sign, or sometimes a double equal sign. What about, uh, what about greater than or less than? The angle brackets, right? Here's the thing. Does that mean redirect the command to dir.txt, or does it mean dir is greater than dir.txt? It means redirect, and in order to give us that character as a redirect, we can't use it as a comparison operator. So PowerShell has a whole separate set of uh, comparison operators. So if you do have some programming experience, just reach into your head and delete it. Get rid of it completely. It's useless now. True or false? Uh, 
Rose, blah, 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 blah. PowerShell is case insensitive on string comparisons unless you use the explicit case sensitive operator. The minus like operator lets you use wildcards on the second operand. So it's a very, very simple pattern matching. There is a minus match operator that is a full bore regular expression operator. So any regular expression fans? That's great, not me. Um, I use them when I have to. But there is a match operator and a C match operator because even though regular expressions in some languages are case sensitive by default, PowerShell, everything is case insensitive by default. There's a minus C match operator for case sensitivity. So let's put some of these uh, comparison operators to use. By the way, I might have not pointed this out earlier, but PowerShell has a whole separate other set of help files called about files. Um, when localized into Canadian, there are boot files. And these detail all of the concepts for PowerShell. These aren't related to a specific command. They tell you about the shell or boot it. So if you wanted to learn about comparison operators, for example, you would say help about underscore, oops, comparison operators. Right there. So there are other comparison operators that we won't be getting in here into uh, today, but that's where you can go read about them. In fact, every single thing I'm going to show you, you can really just pull straight out of the help files. That wacky at sign syntax with the hash table and the custom column that I did. Help select object minus examples. There it is. Now oh, five, four, there's one. Example four has it. Everything I'm showing you comes right out of the help files. So you can go home and look all this up. It's like you don't even need me, but you know, thanks for being here. So let's play with these a bit. Get service where object filter script dollar sign underscore status equals running. What's that going to do? Tell me all the services that are running. Here again, PowerShell is looking for the dollar sign underscore character, and it's going to fill that in with whatever was piped into the command. So we're piping in a service. Therefore, dollar sign underscore represents a service. I don't want the whole service, I want a piece of it. So I follow it with a period, and then the name of the piece I want, the status, and I'm checking to see if it equals running. Any service that meets that criteria gets to stay in the pipeline. Any service that does not meet that criteria gets voted off the island and will not appear in the final episode. So we just get the services that are running. This is one of those opportunities for me to point out how people really do things. No one ever types minus filter script, ever. It is a positional parameter. So long as it appears in the first position, it'll work. And so this is what you'll see. Actually, that's probably what you'll see. There's an alias where that goes to where I'm actually, that's probably what you'll see. The question mark is actually an alias to where object. That's a lot harder to read, right? It's good for job security. Um, my suggestion to most of my customers is that if you're just banging away at the command line and you want to use short aliases like this, it's fine. Save yourself some typing. Your little fingers hurt. Uh, but if you're going to stick it in a script file and make it permanent and inflict it on other people, spell it out. And it's not that hard. W-tab. F-tab, right? If you type it correctly. Tab completion will finish the typing for you. It does not need to be a big stressful thing. How many of you are excellent typists? Me neither. But tab completion, you notice that tab is a very large key on your keyboard, so it's very easy to reach out and strike it with your pinky. So use tab completion. Spell everything out. Now, PowerShell version 3, in an effort to either make this easier to use or simply to make you have to memorize more things, PowerShell 3 has an alternate syntax, which looks like this.
Who thinks that's a lot easier to read? Yeah, I'll agree with you. The actual syntax looks something like that. But you're meant to type it just where status equals running. Here's the problem. If I do it this way, I can only use a single criteria, one comparison. If you need to do anything more complicated, you have to go back to the old this syntax. And that'll work. So from a practical perspective, if you're thinking, I only want to know one way to do this, it's the curly bracket syntax with the dollar sign underscore. You are probably going to start running across that other briefer syntax in the wild. So as you're stealing, sorry, repurposing from other people, you're going to run across that in their blogs and examples and whatnot. So I need you to know that it's legal in PowerShell version 3 and what it does, but it is very limited. It also means that the help file for where object is a lot less useful because it looks like this. Because they've essentially had to create a parameter set for every single possible operator. Because this briefer syntax is really just kind of a hack. But you need to know that it's, that it's there for a reason, right? So let me ask you a question. Status. It sorts by name. Yeah, I'm sorting a whole bunch of stuff and then getting rid of a big chunk of it, aren't I? So remember I told you when we talked about formatting just a moment ago that you really want the formatting to occur at the end of your command line because you can't really have much after formatting. If you format it, you're done. So the kind of the, the proverb in PowerShell is format right. You need to get your formatting all the way to the right. The corollary is filter left. If you're going to be filtering things out of the pipeline, get that done soon, as early as possible, as close to the left side or the beginning of the command line as possible. Get rid of the things so that the rest of the commands don't have to deal with stuff that you were just going to get rid of anyway, right? So you can read it now, and in a case like this, I don't know that Jack will create measurable performance difference, but how many Active Directory users do you have? Anybody? Thousands? Anybody have 10,000? 20? 30? Around 20,000? Yeah, imagine getting all 20 and then saying, show me the ones that are disabled. Right? You wouldn't make an intern do that. Well, you might, but you'd be back. You don't make PowerShell do it. So get your filtering done as early as possible. And in a lot of cases, you'll find that the first command on the command line is pretty capable of that. For example, if I just want to get all the services that start with S, I can do that with the command. I don't actually have to filter at all. I can just tell it to only get me the ones that meet that criteria. So it's going to depend on the capabilities of every individual command, obviously, but that's why you want to read the help file so that you can get that filtering out of the way as soon as possible. Yeah? So we've, uh, we've got one more cool thing I want to talk about. But, let's see, we've got 15 minutes to do it. That'll be a race. What will that do? Yeah, it'll probably blue screen my computer at some point. Usually it'll get down to like the local security authority and blah. Uh, would you say that the stop service command modifies the system state? Yeah. Yeah. So in PowerShell, any command that modifies the system state is supposed to support a parameter called what if. That's what I would have done. 
and it is supposed to support confirm. Are you sure? No, no, no to all. Stop. Yeah, I actually did not hit no to all. I hit yes to all. Whew. And then I hit control C just in time. Uh, I want to talk about why that did what it did. And this is where you're going to need some note paper in front of you. This is the magic of PowerShell. If you can master this next bit, you will be awesome. You will have no problems with PowerShell. But it's tricky. And this is something that most classes don't go into. Most books except mine don't go into. A, a lot of people who use PowerShell every single day have no idea that this is going on under the hood. But I want you to know about it because this is what the magic comes from. When you see a command like this, the first thing you need to do is figure out what type of data is the first command producing. And to acquire that information, we're going to pipe it to get member. The very first line of output tells me the type name of these objects. What is the type name? Just have to read it off the screen. System.ServiceProcess.ServiceController. Now, if you're a developer, all those little bits are important. If you're just an admin, uh, we're going to shortcut it and just take the last bit. So in shortcut, get service produces objects of the type service controller. Write down service controller. We're going to need to know that. Once you have determined what type of object the first command produced, you can start to figure out what the second command is going to do with it. Because here's the trick, kids. PowerShell can only pass to a parameter. PowerShell commands can only take input on a parameter. There's no magic way for the pipeline to send things along. When you pipe something from command A to command B, PowerShell has to attach those things to a parameter. Given that the first command produced objects of the type service controller, do you see a parameter on the second command that can accept objects of the type service controller. What is it? Minus input object. Look in the very first parameter set, the very first parameter is minus input object and it accepts one or more service controllers, yes? It's not enough that it just accepts them though. It has to accept them from the pipeline using a technique called by value. So I've looked at the full help here does input object accept service controller from the pipeline by value? Yes, it does. Therefore, the service objects produced by the first command will attach to this parameter, and this parameter does what? Specifies, it tells it what services to stop. So first command runs, puts a bunch of services into the pipeline, they get hooked up to this parameter because it's by value. PowerShell always tries that first. And then this parameter is what makes those services get stopped. Agreed? Sometimes by value doesn't work out. Who thinks that makes logical sense? Who thinks it won't work? Totally legit. I don't want to hit enter though for a couple of reasons. One, it might. And I'm scared. Um, I want to talk about what it did. So what type of object does get service produce? Service, service controller. We're going to look at the help for the second command. Do you see a parameter that accepts a service controller? Do you see a parameter that accepts the generic type object? No? Then the whole by value plan is dead. PowerShell now has to shift into backup mode, which is called by property name. 
So we need to look at every single parameter in this list and find the ones that accept pipeline input by property name. Holler when you see one. Write down ID. Write down name. Looks like that's it. I need to go back and revisit my service object in get member. Do you see an ID property? Nope, then scratch that one out. Do you see a name property? Ah. Then, and don't overthink this because this is so low tech that sometimes we have trouble accepting how low tech it is. Because the minus name parameter is spelled N-A-N-E, and because the name property is spelled N-A-N-E, because they are spelled the same, they get connected. So all of the name values will be fed to the name parameter. Meaning, all of my service names will be fed to the name parameter of stop process. And I'll sometimes get a hit. We, it's like reading my old English class essays. Red ink everywhere. Nope, didn't get a hit this time. You can see what's happening though is the service name is Ike EXT, but that's not the executable it runs as, and that's what the process would try and stop. On a server, you will get hits here. On a server, you'll often have like DNS, which is the name of a service, and it happens to run as DNS.exe, so there's a match, and it would have stopped it. But that's what my property name does. It picks up the matching property names and hooks them up to the matching parameters, just because they're spelled the same. Would you like to see a case of this being used effectively for something useful? Yes? Good. Go uh, take a break. Take, uh, take 10. We'll come back at 10.32. I'm going to rotate recordings, and then I'll show you how this thing really works. OK. So here's what we're going to do. Um, how many of you guys, I know I asked before, but I'm just checking because we had a little break. You know what a CSV file looks like, right? Okay, so I'm just going to create a new CSV file. Um, wow, that seems like an excessively large font. Let's jack that down a bit. So what's the first line in a CSV file usually? Your headers. So let's do... Uh, What do those look like to you? Active Directory attributes, yeah. So um, I may have used that before, so let's try this one. Um, let's see what I guess. Uh, Greg is my business partner. He doesn't usually do very well in these demos. Chris writes the checks, so he usually gets off okay. Let's save that. Command called import CSV. What this does is it scans through the entire file, and unlike the type command, which is get content, this isn't just reading the text, it's actually parsing it. So each data line becomes an object. So I have three objects here, and my column headers get interpreted as properties. So it creates properties for each of these, about what, five properties each? Yeah. Uh, my plan is to use it with this command, new ad user. Uh, this is loading up the Active Directory module in the background. And you'll notice that this has a few parameters. And if you just kind of let your eyes focus on them for a second, 
you'll notice that most of these parameters really kind of correspond to what you would see in the GUI for Active Directory, right? City, department, title. And if you scroll down and look at the full help, let's get down into the dirt here. Accepts pipeline input by property name, accepts pipeline input by property name, accepts pipeline input by property name, accepts pipeline input by property name. In other words, if I can give new AD object, or sorry, new AD user, an object that has properties which are spelled the same as its parameters, they'll all link up. So you see where I'm going with this? Import CSV, new.csv, pipe to new AD user, and that's literally all I have to do. But I'm not going to. Uh, because I said I really wanted to focus on real world stuff with you guys. If you were to receive a CSV file like this, where would it likely originate in your organization? HR. Uh, worst thing to happen to organized business since taxes. Uh, are they going to get it right? No, because they're HR. They're going to look at it and go, well, there's no one here named Sam. Silly. We'll just call it, we'll call it login. Stupid IT people. What do they know? Uh, and so now, when I run my import CSV somewhere, I don't have a Sam account name property anymore. Can you create a new Active Directory user with no Sam account name? Yes, you can. Once, because it's unique the first time. And let me just take a little sidebar here. The difficulty in using PowerShell has nothing to do with the syntax or finding the commands or running the commands. You can look up all of those things, right? The difficulty with PowerShell is that you are going to be engaged in technology at a lower level without the help of a wizard. And you've not dealt with a lot of these technologies at this level because you've not been allowed to before. The GUI won't let you create a blank SAM account name on a user because the GUI knows it's a stupid idea. Active Directory is just fine with it though, the first time. And so the error I would get, if I tried to run this now, I get two error messages, not three, two. First user would get created, you'd never be able to log on, but it'd get created. And then the second two, the error message would be user already exists. And you would look at that and go, damn it, no, it's not. I, there's no one named Greg Shields and look twice because it's trying to create a duplicate SAM account name, which is the one thing that needs to be unique. The moral of the story is as you start using PowerShell, most of the hurdles you're going to run into more to do with understanding the technology than to do with PowerShell itself. On the plus side, once you conquer those hurdles, you will be a better administrator, period. You will be better at planning, at architecting, at performance tuning, at troubleshooting, and at administering, because you will know really well what's going on under the hood, because you will have had to find out. It is worth the time to overcome these little hurdles because it will make you a better human being in the long run. But in the meantime, I need to fix this problem. Now, I guess one solution here would be to open up the CSV file and edit it, yes? That sounds like work though, and I'm not a big fan of work. So here's what I'm going to do instead. Give me all the properties that were in that file and create a new one called Sam account name and populate it with whatever was in that stupid login field. There's that exact same syntax that I showed you earlier with both select object and format table. And here it's being put to a functional use. I'm using it to munge the object in the pipeline so that it will match what I need to do. Hopefully this will work, or at least give me an interesting error message. Woo. That suggests it worked. Get AD user minus filter all. There they are, Greg Shields, Chris Gannon, Don Jones. 
Uh, for those of you who are curious, did you notice another critical piece of information I omitted when I created those users? Say again? Uh, you don't actually need a VPN. How about a password? Will ADUC let you create a user with a password that is non-compliant? No, but Active Directory is fine with it. In fact, the actual rule is you can create users with blank passwords all day long. You just can't enable them if the password doesn't meet the password policy. So these users are actually disabled. And if I were to pull open the GUI, they would have the little down arrow icon indicating that they were disabled. And then you could, there is a parameter I could have used to set the password, but it's more fun to talk about it. This, though, demonstrates the power of PowerShell's pipeline. This, this is not a script. This is a one-liner. In BB script, this task would have taken 20, 30 lines of code. I can now add more attributes to this simply by putting them in the CSV file. I don't have to change my code at all, so long as I can convince HR to spell everything correctly. I could pull that information from a database, munge it with select object, and type it to new AV user. This is why I like to tell people PowerShell isn't a scripting language, because it can do stuff like this. It contains a scripting language and can do much more. But you can start with it at a very, very basic level and work your way up as you need to. PowerShell has a huge learning curve. But it's a curve, and you can start at the bottom and be effective with it. You don't have to climb the entire hill before you can start doing useful stuff. Questions on how that works or why that works, or anybody want to mint or talk about restaurants? We need to put more caffeine in the coffee. Yes? So um, I noticed that uh, when you do the import, it's still using the that field that you want. Yep, it did retain the login field. I could have used select objects exclude property parameter to get rid of it. But, as you guessed, because it doesn't match anything on new AD user, it just goes away. Anything else? Who could see yourselves using something like this for different bits of work and tasks? Sure. Why not? Okay. Uh, I want to show you this real quick. I'm going to get a list of extensions in PowerShell. Uh, these are all the modules that are installed in my system. Just so you can get an idea of what you can reach out and manage with PowerShell, keeping in mind that a lot, a lot, a lot of these are Windows 8, Windows Server 2012 modules. You're not going to find them on an older system. And given how long it's taking to run, that should give you a clue how many is going to show up in this list. Apart from just showing you the list, you don't need to worry much about these because so long as they're there, PowerShell will find them using help, using get command, if you try to run a command, it will be happy to load this module magically for you in the background. You don't need to worry about it too much. The one thing that you might worry about though is this. How many of you have widely deployed Windows 8? Right? Yeah. How, how, when was the last time you built your admin workstation back at work? Anybody do it recently? You guys will always have to rebuild these stupid things. How long did it take you? Um, three hours. Three hours? That's not too bad. Do you install your admin tools on it, your GUIs and everything else? Yeah, that's not that bad. It takes me like three days to get everything ready. Yeah, Jacob said, yeah, three days. Uh, I asked a guy in class one time, I said, how long is it still working on it? <laughs> But you get this version mismatch thing, don't you? Right? You want the Windows 8 tools, the server 2008 tools, but you can't install those on anything except this. These tools can only go on this. It's like we're supposed to run nine different operating systems to manage everything. Microsoft gets it, and they're fixing it. And they're fixing it through a technology called PowerShell Remoting, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. Remoting uses a technology, a, a protocol called WSMAN. Uh, web Services for Management. And that is implemented by a service called WinRM, Windows Remote Management. This is installed on any machine that has PowerShell installed. It comes with PowerShell. Version 2 of PowerShell can talk to version 3 and vice versa. 
Uh, when they first connect, even though there's some capability differences, they kind of do a little handshake. You guys know who Jeffrey Stover is? He's doing the keynote uh, tonight, tomorrow night, sometime. He invented PowerShell. Uh, we were up on stage at TechEd, and he's describing the handshake. He says, like, two dogs go to the park, and they kind of walk up to each other, and they sniff each other's butts, and they figure it out, and I'm like, wow, that's an image. <laughs> and then I throw his mouse. Uh, great show. So, WinRM is going to be on any machine that has PowerShell installed. How many of you have ever tried, how many of you have used WMI for Evolve? Something like WMI. How about like remote registry editing with the GUI, anything like that? Okay. Those all use remote procedure calls, right? RPCs. Anybody ever get an RPC through a firewall? It's like squishing a, a kitten through cheese claw. It's the most difficult, ugly thing in the world that nobody's happy at the end of the day. RPCs are really tough. They were invented well before firewalls. And they don't play well with them. Microsoft is discarding RPCs for administrative traffic. Instead, they're moving toward this. This uses a single port for all administrative traffic in the email router computer. And the WSCAN protocol is based on HTTP. HTTP is easy to get through the firewall. One port by default, 5985. So you can change that to if you want to. What is neat about HTTP is that you can turn it into HTTPS, which is encrypted. So if you've got a company that's a little security crazy and it just wants to encrypt everything nine times before they put it on the wire, well, we can do it for you. PowerShell actually applies its own application level encryption already. So if you want to encrypt that and then maybe encrypt it again for fun, you can do it. It's HTTPS. So here's the basic setup for this. First of all, Windows Server 2012 comes with this turned on out of the box. And it has to be there because it's how you configure the server. Even if you walk up to the server console, load the management tools right there on the console, it still has to talk to itself via remoting to actually do anything. So there's no difference running the tool locally on the console versus running the tool remotely. So you might as well stay comfy at your desk, run it remotely. On other machines, you do have to turn this feature on. It's very difficult. You run that command. Now, who's excited about running around manually running that on all your computers? Yeah, I thought so. You have two technologies where you could speed this up. The first technology is group policy object. Everything that command does can be replicated with a GPO. Remember I told you to go up to PowerShellBooks.com? Free ebook, Secrets of PowerShell Remoting, complete step-by-step -step screenshot walkthrough of how to set this up with GPO. How many of you have an office that's located near a large uh, college, university? So you can take advantage of a second option called Intern Net. And that's where you get a bunch of college kids, don't pay them and make them run around and type commands. <laughs> this is gonna do several things. It's going to set the WinRM service to start automatically, start it if it isn't already started. It's gonna try and punch a hole in the Windows firewall for the traffic, and it is going to configure a listener. So the listener is what accepts the incoming traffic. The default listener is HTTP on 5985. You can go back and set up an HTTPS listener if you want to. It defaults to 5986. Yes, it takes an SSL certificate. Have to do that. If you would like to know the exact step-by-step -step instructions for requesting the certificate, installing the certificate, and setting up an HTTPS listener. Secrets of PowerShell Remoting, it's a free ebook on PowerShellBooks.com. Step by step by step. It's like 190 pages, that's why I did the thing. So I'm gonna say yes. Yes, I have to say yes several times unless you wanna say yes to all. And okay, I didn't get the error message. Um, if you do this on a client computer, you know how on Windows Vista and later, when you plug into a new network, it wants to know what kind of network it is, and it's either a, a work network, or a public network, or a, a home network, you know what I'm talking about? If you have any network adapters on the computer set to public, the command will fail because Windows Firewall will not allow you to create exceptions when you have a public network adapter. 
And as admin, the time you're most likely to see that, how many of you run a virtualization workstation app? Yeah, and it creates all those little fake network adapters, and they all get set to public. And so it'll fail. Version three of PowerShell, you can skip that with skip network profile check, and it'll do it anyway. So that's how to get around that. So remoting is now set up. That means I can talk to remote computers. For example, enter PS session, computer name, DC. Done. In a domain environment where all the computers, the one you're on, the one you want to talk to, where they're all either in the same domain or they are in domains that have a trust relationship, this will just work. Just work, like Apple made it. It's a... Uh... <laughs> I don't know why they don't like me, Brendan. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that the prompt has changed. It now tells me that I'm on a remote computer. If I was using HTTPS, so uh, Enter PS Session has a parameter called Use SSL that will make it connect by SSL instead. So if I'm using that, then this is an encrypted session, connection. This is roughly our SSH. It's not exactly SSH. Because what happens when I run a command is it's going to take the command on my computer, ship it to the remote computer, the remote computer is going to run it, and it's going to ship the output back to my computer for display. So I'm not actually typing on the remote computer. We have an asynchronous relationship with each other, but it's close enough for government work. So now that I'm here, I can run whatever commands I want to run. Dir, process, kill, whatever else. Let's talk about, yes. Is the communication encrypted even if I don't Yeah, PowerShell applies its own application level encryption by default. You can shut that off if you want to, but that's the default. It just uses a shared secret. When you fire off a If you tell it to execute an executable, the executable needs to live on the remote machine or be accessible to it. So it is going to get the string of text, and then it's going to parse it and try and run it. So it needs to be able to get to the program. If you try and run something graphical, oops, notepad's running, but this isn't remote desktop, kids. You can't do that. So control C will kill that process and get me my line back. Let's talk about security, because this is where everybody likes to get real right about to happen. First of all, how many of you have a security guy in your work who you have to clear for being more secure? Yeah. How many of you are that security guy? Good. Finally, not the right people in the room. You've already opened up a billion ports for management. This is one. It's controllable. It's auditable. And it's kind of like Ethernet, in that if you don't use it, you're not going to manage the server. So you kind of have to use this now. It was optional in previous versions of Windows. It's kind of mandatory now. Here's the good news, though. It's completely security transparent. It does nothing to security plus or minus. My credential has been delegated by the Herberos to the remote computer. That does not mean my username and password are transmitted across the network. That is not how Herberos delegation works. That computer holds a Kerberos ticket signed with my key, which comes out of the active directory. And so any work I ask that computer to do will be done as me. If I perform some task that I don't have permission to do, it'll fail when access denied. If I delete a bunch of users and that will get audited, it gets audited this way too. This is no different than performing the same task through any other tool you might have at your disposal. It is completely transparent from a security perspective. And even better, well, better or worse, depending on what you want to do, it can't delegate it any further. I've given this computer my credential, but it can't give it to anyone else. Now, from a security perspective, that's a good starting point. From a functional perspective, it gets tough though. It means I cannot access UNCs from here if they require authentication. I can't go to any other resource that would require me to authenticate 
is that this computer can't pass my credential law. That would be called the second hop. Or if I made one hop to get there, and if I try to go anywhere else with the second hop, then that's disallowed by default. I am going to show you how to turn it on and how to control it up. So we will do that. So completely security neutral. This does get audited. Uh, it shows up in the log as a network log onto this machine. This machine did not spin up a profile for me. It did not spin up a, a desktop session for me. It didn't have to spin up everything out of the registry, although I do have an AKC user here just as if I had connected with C dollar sign share. Even though remote, uh, remote desktop has gotten better and better and tighter and tighter over the years, this still uses a fraction of the processing power that remote desktop uses. This can be set to unlimited simultaneous connections. This can allow multiple administrators to have multiple connections to it, so it's much more flexible than remote desktop. <coughs> you can control all of those parameters. You can control the idle timeout. You can control how many people you can have. You can control how many processes they can start on the memory they can use. You get a lot of flexibility over this, and by default, the endpoint that I have connected to, so when I connect to the remote computer, I connect to an endpoint that's on a power shelf. That endpoint is locked down by default so that only members of the local administrator group can use it, which effectively means domain admins in a domain environment. Now, if you need to go across domain boundaries, you need to talk to a non domain machine, anything like that, secret to PowerShell or budget and PowerShell.com will actually hear you on our side. Any security questions? Let's just get them out of the way. <coughs> really? Okay, real big trick. Right. So one-to-one -one remoting is what this is called because it's me on one computer talking to one other computer. Exit gets me home. Now I'm back at my computer prompt. There is a protocol called CRED SSP. This is a new authentication protocol that was introduced in Vista. And if you want to be able to delegate your credential across a second hop, you use this command to do it. You run it first on your client computer, telling it it has the role client, and you specify the delegate computer. Typically, your delegate computer will be something like star.mydomain.com. In other words, I'm willing to delegate my credential to any authenticated computer in my domain. So you can use wildcards. Do not just use delegate computer star. That's stupid. It will make a lot of error messages stop happening. But it's done do it. it's making them stop because it's saying, I want to delegate my credential to anybody. I want anybody to be able to pretend to be me, the domain admin. Bad idea. You can use wildcards, but keep it limited. Then on the server, the machine at the other end of the first hop, you run enable WS man credit SSP minus world server. That allows it to receive your credential and delegate it on across one more hop. And then you can continue to set up client server cred SSP for multiple other hops if you need to. Or you can do it all through GPO. GPO overrides local settings, centrally configurable, a lot easier to audit. And the steps for configuring it through GPO are in secrets of PowerShell and writing on PowerShellBooks.com. Step by step, screenshots, the whole deal. So that's the second hop. Who's excited? Who thinks you would use this in your environment? Sure you would, absolutely. You know, I'll show you where it's really cool. What's this computer's name? Get content environment variable computer name. Oh, that's easy. Hello. Let me show you why I think that one-to-one uh, -one remoting is really cool. And we're not going to use the server example. I've logged into my server because I, I want to pretend that my client computer is actually sitting out on a user's desktop. How many of you have ever worked with or on a help desk? Isn't that just the worst? Because here's how it goes. Tell me if this is right. Help desk. Yep, yep, so your computer is going to sleep too well. OK, yep, no problem. Click the troubleshoot link. Yep, click next. Click the second radio button. No, it's the little round one. No, it's the second one. No, 
So that'd be one after that. <laughs> no, no, there is no. No, put back. What's it say on reboot? <laughs> oh, goes. You guys played with the troubleshooters in uh, Windows 7 or Windows or Windows 8? You probably have. You might not even know. You know, like if your network adapter is not working real well, you can put troubleshoot and it pops up a wizard. It's all PowerShell under the hood. Not really graphical. It just looks graphical. So here are you on your workstation. Enter PS session computer name client. Help desk. Yep. Sit tight. Hold. Oh, tell me you're not going to do this now. I fiddle with my DNS too much. And then this happens. Oh, well. Pretend it connected. You're in. We're going to import a module called Troubleshooting Pack. Get Troubleshooting Pack. Windows, Diagnostics, System, Power. Invoke Troubleshooting Pack. This is actually all the code that sits underneath that thing, and it's a command line wizard now. So let's see, we've checked several things, and you look fine, and I want to restore the default sleep setting for the computer. So that would be two, and when I'm finished, I hit exit, and then I take you off hold and go, fix, thanks, bye. I didn't have to walk you through anything. You didn't get to see what I did because it was all done behind the scenes. I didn't have to do a remote request. You didn't have to authorize me. It's not a personal computer, it's my computer. It's the company's computer, and I'm gonna go in behind the scenes and fix stuff, and you're going to stop calling. Really useful technology, even on your client computers, assuming your DNS works. Now, that is kind of a trick. Um, to use remoting, you have to refer to the remote machine by its Active Directory computer name. No aliases, no IP addresses. And that's because it has to do mutual authentication. It's got to be able to look the machine up in Active Directory. And in order to do that, you need to use the right name. Now, if you do need to use an IP address or an alias, there is a way to do it. It involves either using SSL because that provides the mutual authentication, or adding the remote machine to a special list called trusted hosts, which basically means you're not worried about mutual authentication, and there's no chance that it could be spoofed on you whatsoever. And if you needed to do those things, you would read about the steps to do so in Secrets of PowerShell Remoting on PowerShellBooks.com. Yeah, believe me, I took like a month and figured out every possible scenario. It's also got a huge chapter on troubleshooting, because uh, a lot of times, this is fun, being an MVP is neat because sometimes we get to go up to Microsoft for a big summit and we get to talk to the product team and they ask us, seriously, what don't you like about the product? Tell, tell us what you do like, tell us what you don't like. We said, we would like some better error messages because the only error message that remote seems to spit out is access denied, which makes troubleshooting a little tough, right? You know, there's eight moving pieces here. Version three is much better about that, by the way. So they said, you know what, no problem, we're going to go to the developer. So they chop the developer in the room. She says, well, what error messages would you like to see better? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> How about anything but access denied? Well, you know, she makes a very good point, which is that, you know, if somebody gets their username wrong or, or their password wrong, the error message is always username or password. You're not going to give someone a clue when it comes to breaking security. And that's kind of where they got through with promoting. They said, we don't want to tell you what's wrong because it's going to be the system. She said, but why don't you just use the diagnostics log? And he said, well, what? He said, oh, it's the PS diagnostics module. Huh? She said, yeah, it's on every machine. Just run import module PS diagnostics. And we're like, oh. All right, well, show me what's in there. Git command module PS diagnostics. Oh, okay, so enabling traces. Great. Well, I know I know how to use PowerShell. I'm just going to read the help for this thing. Enable PS trace. Oh. Oh, well, that's not helpful. And she said, well, would you like to see a demo? Yes, please. And so they walked us through an entire demo of capturing all this trace information, and we got to walk through several failure scenarios 
so that we could see what those looked like in the log so that we could recognize, ah, that's what the log looks like when this is broken. That's what the log like, looks like when that is broken. And it's all screenshotted and captured for you in Secrets of PowerShell and PowerShell.com. Yeah. So there's a whole troubleshooting chapter in there for you as well. You're welcome. Who, uh, so again, who likes one-to-one -one remoting? Who thinks you can use this SSH-like thing? Yeah, sure. Here's what's better. Invoke command. Give me him, give me him, and run this. Yeah, it won't talk back to localhost, that's okay. Probably because I stopped a bazillion services earlier. I should reboot. Anyway, invoke the command is designed to take one or more computer names, as many as you want. Microsoft has tested this on around 25,000 computers, and then they ran out of computers. It will only talk to 32 simultaneously. That is its throttle limit. There is a parameter for it called minus throttle, and it does. You change that if you want to. So 32 at once, and then the rest queue up, and as it starts finishing some, it goes out and gets the next one, and it will eventually work its way through all of them. If you are running the command, if you run it over command on a hacky enough machine, you can bump up that throttle limit because your machine is the only one that pays the price. Every simultaneous connection is a thread of PowerShell and a little bit of memory. So if your workstation, let's say, has four quad core sockets and 64 gigs of RAM, throttle limit at 10,000. You'll be fine. And you'll get a lot of computers talking to you simultaneously. In fact, I think you should go home and tell your boss that you need a four socket quad core, write this down, four socket quad core with 64 gigs of RAM. And it needs to have backup fans that are powerful enough to make it hover an inch off the ground. <laughs> Got it? So you can jack that up as much as you want to. Whatever goes into the script block gets transmitted to the remote machine, it executes it, and sends the results back to your machine. Pretty much just like the SSH. Everybody do that? This is better because it's built in, it's free, and you can use it in a lot of different ways. You can have it use SSL if you want to, there's a nice SSL switch, you can use alternate ports if you've configured alternate ports, whatever you want to do, it'll do it. Multiple machines simultaneously, nothing cooler than that. And a billion of them as easily as one. You know, let's say uh, I've got a whole mess of machines and I need to install the Telnet client on them. Give it your whole mess of machines, script block, add Windows feature, name, Telnet client. Done. Let it run. It'll come back and tell you what happened. Manage multiple computers just as easily as managing one. Now these endpoints, see, work. These endpoints that you connect to with this, um, I haven't specified an endpoint, so it's just connecting to the default Microsoft PowerShell endpoint. You can create custom endpoints. How many of you have ever had to create a tool that you distributed to maybe your help desk or to end users, and you needed to do something that they didn't have permission to do and that you didn't particularly want to give them permission to do? You just wanted to give them a very constrained little tool to do some particular task. Has ever happened? Watch this. You start by creating a new PS session configuration file. Let's just look at the help for it. You can have this configuration or this endpoint automatically pre-import specific modules, commands, and so forth. Modules to import and so on. You can shut off PowerShell scripting language so that whoever's dialed into this thing can't write scripts, they can just run commands. And regardless of what commands you import, you can make whatever you want actually visible. You can import 30 modules and only have 10 commands available inside this little configuration. Uh, you can have it do all sorts of locking down and restrictions with aliases and everything else. So this creates a file on disk. 
basically an INI file. And then you run register PS session configuration file to make the thing active. Here's the coolness. You can have an access control list on this. So you'll notice the parameter on here, uh, minus show security descriptor UI, right there. That'll pop up a security dialog, standard permissions dialog. That lets you decide who is allowed to dial into this thing. And then you can specify a minus run as credential. Meaning regardless who you dial into it, run every command as this credential is set. But they can only run the commands that you put in here. You can even remove parameters. You're going to run this one command, and you get these two parameters, and I'm going to hard code these five, and you can't change those, and you can't get to anything else. And it's going to run as a domain admin account, but only certain people are allowed in here, and you can only do this one thing. You can set up declarative delegated administration this way. Use PowerShell to write yourself a little GUI front end to give to them, have it fire the commands by remoting into this configuration, and they can only do what you've given them permission to do. Cool, right? Would you like to see like a walkthrough example? Great, secret to PowerShell remote and PowerShell <laughs> I thought that. With the GUI? Um, yeah, kind of with the GUI, but yeah. I don't walk you through creating the whole GUI. Does anybody ever want to create a GUI in PowerShell? There's a product uh, from Sapien called PowerShell Studio. Get that. It's like a draggy, droppy Visual Studio, but it spews PowerShell scripts out the back end. So it's, it's useful for that. I don't think I have it on here. We, we could dive into it later. I'll see. Any questions about remoting to this point? Who thinks you might have trouble getting this going in your environment? Who can't wait to get home and set it up? Yeah, that's the right answer. This is the way forward. Windows Server 2012 actually has a few services that have been split into two, and you'll see legacy listeners. Um, in fact, let's see, GSV, name DC, no, oh, just DC. Oops, computer name. The Under brr, 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 maybe L, then maybe W. Yeah, Windows Management Instrumentation uh, Legacy Listener. So what that is is the old RPC communications are going in through a separate service and being funneled over to the new WS Man enabled service. So Microsoft is moving away. This, this remoting thing is something you're going to have to have in your environment sooner or later. Uh, and there's a, a lot of utility with it too. So you might as well get it sooner. Benefit everybody. Yeah? Who wants to talk about Windows management instrumentation? Wow, that's an outpouring of, of demand. How many of you have never worked with WMI? Seriously answer this question, because I'll skip over some stuff. Okay, quite a few people have. So, Here's the easy way to get a quick look at it. <clears throat> um, MMC, add remove thingy, WMI control, local computer, click, right click, properties, security. So here's the basis of WMI. Uh, it is broken down into a series of namespaces, uh, and that's what each of these folders represents. And that's the folder is really all they are. They're an organization thing. They're just designed to group things. And you'll notice it tends to group things by technology. Um, Microsoft, Policy, RSOP, Security Center, Service Model, on a domain controller, you'll have one for Active Directory, probably DNS. And within these namespaces, you have classes. Each class represents some portion of the operating system or hardware that you could potentially manage. Most of this is read-only. It's designed to retrieve inventory and information. Anybody use uh, SCCM? Yeah, SCCM is like it's built around WMI. 
You guys ever have WMI repository corruption issues? Sure. Yeah, everybody does. Those of you who don't have SCCM just don't know it. Uh, SCCM doesn't know they have it. Most of the problems have been resolved in Windows 7, so it should get better going forward. PowerShell is pretty good at querying this. I want to emphasize something though. This is an external technology. This is not part of PowerShell. It is something PowerShell can tap into. For example, get WMI object, namespace, root CIMV2. This is the default namespace. It's where all of the cool operating system stuff comes from. List everything and sort it by name. It's going to take a little bit. Uh, there's quite a lot of classes in there. And most of the good ones are the Win32 ones, including all these performance counter ones that just scroll by. We can get the perk on stuff with this. So how many of you have a tape drive attached to your laptop? <laughs> but if you have, regardless, you still have the Win32 tape drive class because it could potentially be there. What you have is zero instances of it. Have a tape drive, you have one instance of the Win32 tape drive class. So to query one of these classes, once you know the name of it, oh, and incidentally, toughest part about WMI, finding the class that has the bits you need. And the way to do that is Google, trial, and error. No way to make that simpler. It's just WMI is not well documented anyplace. Uh, these ones are, you can punch the class names into Google and you'll get Microsoft's doc page for it. Uh, but outside of this particular namespace, root CIMV2, not so much. But once you know what you want, get WM object, give it a class, uh, Win32 operating system. If you want to give it a computer name, that's cool. It does talk to computer names sequentially. Right? So if you give it a hundred computer names, how long is it going to take? A minute. Or a hundred. Uh, how many of you think you might need the query information from multiple computers? Because if you do, I'll show you a better way. Yeah? That can send the command out in parallel to multiple computers. They run it locally and send the information back to you. So it can run in parallel. Both techniques will spew an error message and keep going if one fails somewhere in the middle. So they will keep going. Uh, and then you can do lots of stuff to trap that and log it. And we'll, we'll get there this afternoon. Keep in mind that these things are just objects. So you can pipe them to get member and see that there's quite a lot of information available. <coughs> Some of them will have methods. Now these methods are actions you can ask the thing to take, such as uh, rebooting the computer, setting its date or time, shutting it down, a couple of different ways to shut it down, stuff like that. The trick with WMI is finding the class that contains the bits you need, and there is no way to make that faster. It is just pure angst, trial and error and searching and hoping that somebody else knows and will tell you. There is a new version of this. So WMI is built on a set of half-formed standards from the 90s. The fully formed standards are done and are referred to now as SIM. Same repository. Same classes. This communicates over WS man. So this uses Windows remote management, same as remoting did. Cool? I mean, right now, this is only going to work on machines where PowerShell version 3 is installed, Windows 8, Windows Server 2012. But this is Microsoft's go forward. This is what they're investing in going forward. The old get WMI object is not going to get any better than it is right now. This will continue to get improved. Good enough. We are going to circle back to WMI in a little bit, uh, and we'll talk about how to activate methods and things like that, and there's a few techniques for doing so. But in the meantime, any WMI-related questions, now that you've kind of seen the basics of how it works? No? When you do invoke examples, you get the results that the same type of line on the next, uh, that you do in the next 
Yes. Uh, when, you, when you run invoke command like this, and I get the results back, I can then pipe that to, you know, select property build number version ps computer name format table auto size. So yeah, it, they behave exactly like any other object. Ideally, you want to do as much of your pipelining and processing on the remote computer as possible because that distributes it. And then do as little as possible to what comes back, but whatever. Good? You don't look convinced. Okay. All right. Let's start talking gently about PowerShell scripting because there's a couple of things I want to show you so that we can build up to some more cool stuff. Uh, one common thing across most programming and scripting languages is support for variables. Everybody familiar with those? Who remembers algebra? Who remembers it fondly? That's what I thought in a year. You know, before we do that then, let's, let's step back to algebra. There's a set of symbols in math that means do this first. What are they? P parentheses, open and close parentheses, yeah. So, what if I wanted to get WMyObject class Win32 computer system, and what if I wanted to get that from a list of computers? So let's, let's open up Notepad again. And I'm just going to punch in DC localhost, DC, that, that's good. Save that, C computers. PowerShell's totally jiggy with parentheses. Parentheses mean run this first. So the first command that runs here is going to be what? Get content. It's going to read those names and then plug them into the computer name parameter. So that's one way of targeting multiple computers with a command instead of having to manually type out a comma separated list. Now how many of you have got text files that list computer names? Already. So yeah. Probably like a specific kind of computer, right? Like domain controllers or whatever else. Do you have anywhere else in your environment where you have like a big database of computer names? Active Directory. Sure. Get AD computer minus filter star. Get me all of them. I have a gigantic domain. This returns an object. Now the computer name parameter on most commands don't want an entire object. They just want a string of letters and numbers and stuff, right? Is there a property on here that does contain the computer's name? Name. Name's good. So I could do this then, right? Yeah? You can't feed that to a computer name parameter, though, because it's not a string. If you pipe that to GM, it's a selected AD computer object. If you look at the help file, most computer name parameters just want to see a string. This isn't a string. It's a whole object that just only has one property. There's a slightly different syntax you want to use. Notice the, whoops. Notice the difference in the output. When I used minus property, I had a name column with two values. When I use expand property, I just get the values. They're just strings now. I've, a better name for this would be extract, because that's what it's doing, is extracting the values out of the name property. And so now, class, Win32 BIOS, computer name. So that's another way of getting multiple computers and a really, really useful technique for extracting the contents of the property that has the information you need. So 
Now we've covered parentheses part of variables, let's, uh, of algebra. Let's talk about the variable part of algebra. That is a variable. Now this is a really, 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 really important distinction that I'm about to ask you to make. And I'm going to demonstrate it, but I've got to say it a couple times. The variable name is A. The dollar sign is not part of the variable's name. If you think of a variable as a box with A written on it, A by itself refers to the box. Dollar sign A means open the box and get what's inside. You see the difference? There's the contents of the box and there's the box itself. For example, What just happened? Change the value of the variable. Change the value of the variable to. Okay, good guess. Anyone else? What does dollar sign A mean? It means get the con. Dollar sign A means get the contents of A. Contents of A is five. I created a variable called five. Everybody see why? That created a variable named x. Variable names do not include the dollar sign. The dollar sign is a cube to get the contents of the variable. That's a big trip up point in the shell. So for the most part, PowerShell variable names can, you're typically gonna see people use letters, numbers, underscores. Provided you enclose the variable name in curly brackets, a variable name can contain anything but more curly brackets. I do not think this is a good idea. I do not recommend it to you, but you will see it. People do it. And you would access that just by typing the entire thing. The name of the variable includes the curly brackets, yes. And if you look at the variable disk drive, you'll see it there, right there. Now I just told you that PowerShell keeps its variables in a disk drive. How would I permanently remove a variable? What would be the command? What's the command to permanently remove a file from the file system? Del. How would I permanently remove a variable? Del. Because it's just a disk drive. Do you think it's going to let me delete one of these built-in variables? Yes, totally. But it's not permanent. Those things get reconstructed every time you open up a new shell. There's no persistence between shell sessions. So you can mess it up all you want to, close the shell, open it back up. It'll be exactly the same every single time. None of this persists. Okay, now for the fun stuff. Uh. You guys see the difference between those two commands? Singles and doubles. PowerShell lets you use either for delimiting a string. The difference is that in double quotes, it looks for the dollar sign. And it assumes that all characters after the dollar sign, up till an illegal character, is a variable name, and it will replace it with its contents. Neat, huh? Means you never have to concatenate strings. You can just jam variables right into double quotes, 
and create strings, and it's much easier to look at. Variables can contain more than one thing. Whatever is on the right side of the equal sign gets executed, and the results are put into whatever's on the left side of the equal sign. To get to a single object, use square brackets. That's the first one. Second one, next to the last, the one before that, period if you just want a piece of it. Cool? Problem is, that won't work. You see, the square bracket's not a legal variable name character. So it took dollar sign services, said, well, there's a bunch of stuff in there, so I assume you just want to list out all the names, which it did. And then there's my square bracket zero. So the solution for that is not string concatenation. It's called a sub-expression, which starts with a dollar sign and puts the entire thing in parentheses. Super useful trick, because again, no string concatenation. You can just jam anything into double quotes, and it'll run it. Neat, right? What type of information is in X? This is not a trick question. It's a number, an integer, a whole number. What type of information is in Y? String. So what is the result? Error. Ha! You don't know PowerShell. It decides what the plus is based on the first operand and will either do addition or string concatenation and it will try and munge the second one into being whatever type seems to go well with that operation. Um, yeah, I know. Who thinks this can be problematic? Yeah, here's why. Right? Now at some point this is going to go badly in my script, isn't it? But it's not going to be at a point where it makes sense because the actual error will have occurred right here. So here's what you can do instead. You can tell PowerShell this variable is only allowed to contain this type of data. And it will honor that until you manually change it. Cool? Everybody still with me? So where do variables come in handy? Well, when we just did remoting, we were doing what I call ad hoc remoting. We were connecting to a remote machine, which involves a certain amount of TCP magic, I imagine. Uh, the remote machine had to run up a copy of PowerShell. It ran my command, transmitted the results back to me, shut down that copy of PowerShell, and tore down the TCP connection. So some overhead there, set up, clean up. What if I was wanted, wanting to hit the same machine with multiple commands in a row? Kind of a lot of overhead. Wouldn't it make more sense to establish a connection and lead it up? Sure, this is called PS session. I now have a PS session opened to computer name DC that is available for use, and I've stored a reference to the session in the DC variable. So now I can invoke a command like dir, and instead of giving it a computer name, I'll just give it one or more sessions. Once it's finished, my session remains up and available. Now you want to see something awesome that version 3 does? Let's say I need to go over to another computer now, but I want to leave this up and running.
Session's now disconnected, still running, right? This is like closing your remote desktop window and it leaves it running on the computer. So now I scurry over to my other computer. Here I am. Get me the PS session from the computer name DC and put that into variable X. So what's in X? Ah, I do have one there. Awesome. X reconnect. Oop, I think it's just connect. Forgot my verb. Is it lunchtime? Is that what that means? So now I've reconnected that session. I can now access whatever it was doing, whatever commands it was running, blah, dee, blah, 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 right? The only trick here is that if you close your shell, it will not auto disconnect a session. When you close your shell, it closes. So you, if you want to disconnect and reconnect later, it's a manual step you have to take. When you're done, get PS session. Oops. Remove PS session. Close them all. Good. Yes. Starting to see some use for that stuff. Questions so far? Variables, remoting, sessions. Do you want to see the number one coolest thing? Because if you remember, I started out this entire conversation with the whole management tools version mismatchy garbage, right? Let's fix that. DC equals new PS session computer name DC. Get module from, I want to list all the available ones. Get module PS session, that was it. Show me the modules that are loaded on that computer. All right, fun stuff. Oh, DHCP server. You know, I'd like to do something with DHCP server. Problem is, I'm running on an XP machine. I can't install the DHCP module on my computer. I can't install the Windows 8 RSAT on XP, so I guess I'm out of luck. Import module. The module I want is DHCP server, and I want to pull it from, is it session or PS session? Why aren't you giving me pop-ups? PS session DC. Watch it, because it's going to make little flashies. It just constructed a local fakeout module called DHCP. My copy of PowerShell thinks that I have the DHCP module installed locally. Under the hood, anytime I try to run one of those commands, it's going to carry across that session and execute on the remote computer, and the results are going to come back. It's called implicit remoting. And it means that you don't have to install management tools on your computer anymore. You leave them on the server and you consume them as just another service from that server. Get DHCP. Look, it's even tab completing this for me because it thinks they're here. Run the command and the results come back. Help get DHCP server in DC, goes to the other computer, gets the help, and displays it as if it was installed locally. This is where sessions become really, really powerful. Imagine having a little startup script run every time you open PowerShell, and it creates connections to the servers that you tend to manage the most and brings their modules over to your computer. You can run everything as if it was installed without installing a thing. You can have Exchange 2010 commandlets living alongside Exchange 2007 commandlets because when you import a module, one of the things you can assign to it is a prefix. 
Meaning instead of having two different versions of get mailbox, I could have get 2007 mailbox and get 2010 mailbox by assigning those prefixes when I imported them from the remote computers so that everything can live side by side. No version mismatching because they're actually just running on the servers. And you know why that's awesome? I did not know this, but did you know that an Exchange server has an incredibly high speed connection to Exchange? It makes sense to run the command <coughs> on the server because that's where all the bits are. So now you don't have to install stuff anymore. You can just consume it via remoting. Come on, that's awesome. You've had that machine built in 30 minutes. Don't have to go hunting around for tools and ISO images and all that garbage. You don't need the RSAT anymore. You can have a Windows 8 machine managing all your different server versions because they've got the right commands. And you just consume them from there. Thank you, Siri. <laughs>